We've been looking at this theme, one anothering, living in a gospel community for, I think this is our seventh or eighth consideration of it. And the first message we preached uh, was from John 13, 31 to 35, where Jesus commands us to love one another as He says, love one another as I have loved you. That The song selection was perfect. We've, we cannot love one another as we ought without being a recipient of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ in salvation. And then in being a recipient of that to, to purpose to show that to others. Today we're looking uh, for the second time at Romans chapter 12, uh, verses 9 to 13, that loving one another with a family affection is what we're called to do. And that's a special, there's a special word here used in our text we're going to look at in a moment, but Romans 12, 9 to 13, if you have found that passage, would you stand with me? If you don't have your Bible, we're going to put the text on the screen so that you can see it. And as I read it aloud, you read it silently, asking yourself, is this the way that I love the family of faith called Bethel Baptist Church? Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. What have we just read together? We've read the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And may this exhortation given to us as, we are, as we're trying to enlarge our thinking about loving one another, living in a gospel community, one anothering, that becoming a part of our vocabulary and a part of our lifestyle. May the Lord enlarge our hearts to receive the love of Christ that He has for us and to stimulate and provoke in us the desire to love one another as He has loved us, to love one another as a family of faith. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, the, the first sermon we preached in this series was Jesus commands us to love one another out of John 13, 31 to 35. The next installment was the love of God as the motivation to love one another, 1 John 4, 7 to 12, then loving one another as friends of Jesus, John 15, 12 to 17. Loving one another as evidence of faith in Jesus Christ, 1 John 3, 11 to 24. There were two parts to that, uh, those sermons. Then loving one another with family affection last Sunday. Loving one another with family affection part two today. I told you that what we're doing is we are laying the foundation for the one another's in the New Testament. And anchoring that is the command to love one another. And as we begin to expand out, when we, when we covered all the passages in the New Testament that address loving one another, as we expand out to serving one another, encouraging one another, blessing one another, provoking one another, you'll realize that all of that depends on a love of Jesus Christ for us and our love for Christ, which manifests itself in others. Last week we looked at this idea of this call to genuine love. The, the uh, text in verse 9, let love be genuine. Uh, the, I think it's the Christian Standard Bible. Uh, let love should not be hypocritical. We told you that the, the idea here of love is agape love. It's that unconditional love. It's that love that is only known. Hear me now. It is only known to people 
who have been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. A married couple that does not know Jesus Christ can love one another with every ounce of their being, but they cannot show this love to one another. It is imparted in the new birth by the Holy Spirit. Agape love. And it must not be hypocritical. It must not wear a mask. I challenged you last week. I said, let's, in this one anothering adventure that we're going on together, let's take the masks off. Let it be genuine. Let it not be Hippocrates. Let it not be love behind the mask. This exhortation to hate what is evil. Hate it. Jesus said you cannot serve two masters. You'll love one, you'll hate the other. Because you cannot love God and love mammon or you cannot love God and love the things of the world. What John describes in 1 John 2, 12-15, the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. He said that doesn't originate from the Father. It's in the world. And, and the world is passing away. It's decaying. It's coming to a fiery end. And the lusts that come from the world are going to burn up with it. But the one who is proud Sing the will of God, doing the will of God. He is the one who is abiding, remaining forever in God. You've got to hate what is evil. Hold fast or cling. I told you the word there is the word for cleaving. A man leaves and cleaves. He clings to what is morally good. So today now we want to look at, at these at verses 10 to 13, having, having sort of set that backdrop admonition. To speak that, that genuine love has a familial nature. That is, it's, it's family. You know, I, love, I love all children. I love my children in a way that I don't love anybody else's children. And that's right. They have my DNA. They're gifts to our family from God through, through birth. Familial love. But you know, when we're saved by grace through faith, we have a different kind of DNA. We have a spiritual DNA. No matter how you were saved, when you were saved, the common experience of grace that you and I share with one another supersedes any differences we might have. It makes us family. He places us into a family. Behold, John says in 1 John, he, he's amazed. Behold, what manner of love the Father has shown to us that we should be called children of God. And he says, and that's what we are. We are that. If we're children of God, then we're brothers and sisters in Christ. And this genuine love has a familial nature. Look around you for just a moment. Just look around you. Ask yourself, do I love these people like family? If I don't, don't be satisfied there. Don't be content to live there. Ask the Lord. Lord, show me what to do. Show me how I need to love one another better. What can I do to... I said to ask you last week, look around and can you name everybody in here? You would not be impressed with me as a father or a husband. I was introducing my family to you. And I said, now this is, uh, this is, this is uh, what's your name again? You would go, oh my goodness. Either, either dementia has really set in or there's something wrong in that family. We need to know one another. God expects that. And so there's this, these verses 10 to 13. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute 
to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. And we read the rest of this passage responsively today. But this is the core of what I want to suggest to you today helps us know what familial love in the body of Christ looks like. We told you when we went through 1 Corinthians that 1 Corinthians 13 shows us, if anything, that love is an action. It's an attitude. It does things. It doesn't do things. Same thing here. And so this, this exhortation, love one another with brotherly affection. The word for love here is an unusual word. It's, it's built upon a compound that you don't find many other places. We've told you before about the word for, words for love. Agape love is one of them. Phileo love, which is a part of this word here. It's the brotherly love. The city of Philadelphia is literally phileo adelphos, love of brother, Philadelphia, brotherly love. And then eros love, the love that, that's, that's a love of intimacy. It's a, it's a physical love. This word is the word philostargos. Now you hear in that philo, there's that, that uh, uh, friend, brother, phileo. But this other word, storge, in the Greek, speaks of a natural family love or tender affection. The Scripture talks about when, when a heart is hardened. When God removes His hand from a culture, it says that the women will be without natural affection. Talks about children turning against parents, fathers turning their backs on children. This is without natural affection. The, the familial love here, this, this word, it's a natural family love or tender affection. It is loving with that natural affection that characterizes members of the same family. The, the antonym of this, if you put an alpha primitive in front of the word storge, it's hateful. I remember very well when we were in seminary. Karen and I, I think I've told you, we were the, of this cluster of about eight to ten couples that we became close with in seminary. We were the first couple to find ourselves with child. Okay? And so Karen was getting ready, you know, in the early stages. I remember sitting around on Sunday evenings. Uh, we went to this place called, was it the back porch or the front? The back porch ice cream place. And... Uh, talking. And I remember the women. Now Karen was pregnant. And she's undergoing these changes. The Lord does this. When, when a woman finds herself with child, he, uh, she begins to take on this, this real maternal instinct that's awakened. And our friends, the, the female friends in these groups, I remember them going, ooh, that's just going to be so awful. I just can't but one by one, as they found themselves with child, Transformation begins. It's a natural affection. Built in by God. And when He saved you, when He born you again, when you were born again, He put into you this natural affection. And you show me somebody that doesn't care for the body of Christ, you show me somebody that can take or leave being with the people of God, I'll show you somebody that has, has no storge and they have no grace. But I know people that have been hurt. Yeah. I've had family hurt me. I love them. I've been pastoring almost 45 years. You don't hang around that long in the pastorate unless you're committed to loving the people of God as Jesus has loved me. Now, yeah. you've been hurt. What's the point? Not an excuse, it's just a reality. Only people who don't get hurt in this world are people who isolate themselves from everybody else, and they're the most miserable people on the planet. So hear me today. Love 
one another. This, this reciprocal pronoun. In other words, it's a pronoun that never stands alone apart from anything else. It assumes another. You can't do this pronoun on your own. It requires being a part of another with brotherly affection. So have, have a familial love as a family. That's what he's saying here. The word here is the word Philadelphia. Have a family affection with the standard of love that Jesus calls upon His disciples to have for one another. Follow me now for a moment. You have to have agape love in order to show brotherly love the way Jesus expects us to. Remember at the end of John's Gospel? Jesus takes Peter aside. Peter had betrayed Jesus, denied Him. He said, Peter, do you agape me? Peter now, still he's still struggling. He was thrilled when Jesus said to the other disciples, go tell the disciples and Peter to meet me at such a place. Because Peter would not have come basically on the invitation of the disciples. He figured he had blown discipleship. Go tell the disciples and Peter to meet me. So he takes him aside. Do you agape me? Peter says, Lord, you know I phileo you. Jesus says the second time, Peter, do you agape me? Peter says, Lord, you know I phileo you. Third time, Peter. The word even is not there, but the sense of it is. So like, Peter, do you even phileo me? Pierce. He wept. He broke. Jesus was restoring him from his denying he even knew Jesus, betraying Jesus. That's how you bring people back into the family. That's what he was doing. This brotherly love, real quickly, look at it in the scriptures. First Thessalonians 4 9. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. You see that there? Paul says, if you've been saved, the Spirit of God, your teacher, is teaching you to love one another. Now we may not do it like we ought to, we may get distracted by the things of the world, but it's there. My point is it's there. Cultivate it. We're going to look at how in a moment. Hebrews 13.1, let brotherly love continue. See, in the body of Christ, this is people give up too quickly. Well, I tried that and it didn't work. I'm called to do that there where I will. That's, that's the disciple's response. The pragmatist decides quickly whether it works or not. 1 Peter 1, 22, Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, that is, the sanctification that's going on according to the truth, obeying the truth, is unto or for the purpose of a sincere, a genuine brotherly love. Love one another earnestly from a heart being purified. You know what will happen? One of the measures, are, am I growing in grace? Do I love the people of God more? Let me tell you something. If the older you get, the, the bigger your attitude is, I can take or leave the people of God, then you're not loving the brothers. And there's a, there's a big question mark over whether or not you're actually growing in sanctification or whether you're backsliding. The Scripture defies this kind of nonsensical thinking we see today. Love one another earnestly from a heart being purified. 2 Peter 1, 7. And godliness with brotherly affection. It's talking about building upon these things and brotherly affection with love. 
if you read the whole passage there, your godliness is strengthened by your brotherly affection for one another. And brotherly affection is strengthened by agape love. You see it? So with that in mind, I want to just go through nine exhortations that are given here in this text. First of all, outdo one another in showing honor. That is, don't require for yourself to be preeminent. That's the word there. Don't insist. The devil would have you think, well, people don't think very much of you. They don't, they don't recognize you. They don't, he's, he's just bombarding all the time, lying, lying, lying. And the answer to that is, well, I don't have time for that. I'm called upon to outdo one another in showing honor. The point is here that nobody should show more honor to another than I do to you or you do to someone else. And if you're content to say, well, I'll leave that to somebody else, then you, are, you cannot possibly be outdoing one another in showing honor. Are you intentionally thinking about that? That's how you have family love in the body of Christ. You walk in thinking, how can I, how can I bless so-and-so today? How can I tell so-and-so what, what an encouragement they are? How can I encourage them? That's outdoing one another in honor. The second one is a negative. Not slothful in zeal. That is, not reluctant to be eager. Brother and sister, I'm going to tell you something. We have an enemy of our souls who wants you to be complacent, who wants you to lick your wounds, who wants you to be lethargic, who wants you to be half-hearted. If he can get all those things going or any combination of those things in your life, then he can, he can cut the nerve on your earnestness, on your zeal. A little sleep, a little slumber, slumber. A little folding of the hands. A little yawning spiritually. And he's got you. So you purpose. You take what he just said before, outdoing one another and showing honor. And you say, I'm not going to be, real, I'm not going to be slothful in this. I'm going to be eager to do this. I'm, I'm not going to be half-hearted about it. I'm not going to be timid about it. But I don't know so-and-so. All right. Let me, let me just remove that obstacle. Hey, I ought to know your name. I may even know it and I may have forgotten it. Please tell me again. I want to get to know you. That's not hard, is it? Does that send somebody into tremors? Do you, do you have to go hide in a safe space for that? Simple. Simple. If you don't realize you've got an enemy of your soul working with you right now trying to tell you that what this preacher is telling you is a bunch of nonsense, he wants to put you on ice. And we're not going to do that. Zelos has a burning about it. We're going to melt the ice. We're going to melt the ice. Third, be fervent in spirit or fervent in the spirit. It's a, it's a picture here of being inflamed in the Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit kicks in at some point, folks. If you're going to keep in step with the Spirit, if you're going to walk in the Spirit, if you're going to be led by the Spirit, all these pictures we have in Romans and Galatians, then the Spirit's going to lead you with a growing passion. This is what I'm hoping and praying is happening as we're studying these passages and and, and praying up to the delivery of them, is that there will, there will begin to be a burning in you that maybe, maybe has cooled off. That the Spirit's going to start blowing on the ember. And it's going to be one of those things, one of those, one of those uh, apostle things. We cannot help but, and then fill in the blank. I cannot help but one another, my family of faith. Can't help it. It goes against my nature, my old nature. Not my new nature. It goes against what comes instinctive for me, but I've, but I've been given a new life. Partakers 
of the divine nature, growing in godliness. I cannot help but fervent, inflamed. And then serving the Lord. He gives a descriptive here. See, how do you, how you serve Jesus? Well, preacher, I just don't have a lot of... Do you know that if you will take a step to one another, one another, that you're serving the Lord in as much as you've done it, one of the least of these, you've done it to me. I just want to live for Christ and reach across the pew, reach across the aisle, go out of your way to love one another. You become a slave of Jesus Christ. You're not your own. Well, I like to keep to myself. You're not your own. You've been bought with a price. The blood of the Lamb of God was shed for you. Glorify God with your bodies. Glorify God in your actions. This nation's filled with half hearted, half converted people who imagine that the minimal amount, it's, it's, the, it's the typical, you hear this from some people. Well, how much have I got to do? Really, how little have I got to do? This multitude headed for hell thinking they're going to heaven. No place for that in the family of God. And if you don't love with a, with a burning zeal the family of faith now, don't fool yourself thinking that you're going to be loving in eternity in heaven. It just doesn't happen. It doesn't feel good to hear, I know. But I love you too much to blow kisses at you. Don't let, don't let the temper and temperature of the culture dictate to you. This Word needs to be like so much firewood piled up in your heart that the Spirit sets on fire. Be a slave of the Lord. Fifth, rejoicing in hope. Rejoicing in hope. You see, the devil wants to drag you down. He wants you to be discouraged. He wants you to convince there's no use. Does no good. Makes no difference. But you come back time and time again to the joy of of the Gospel. Remember what you were. Before He saved you. Remember where your hope was. For some of you, your hope was in the completely wrong things. For some of you, life was just hopeless. You couldn't talk about hope. You could talk about hopelessness. Received a note from somebody the other day friend who lives somewhere else. He said, it's just hopeless. So you remind one another of the Gospel. Rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice, the Apostle Paul says. You can't rejoice too much. When you think about Jesus, and think about what He did for you, what He's done for others, Rejoicing comes out. You can't stifle it. That happiness or joy in the hope of the Gospel, the good news that God loves sinners. That's, that's good news for you personally if you have been saved by grace through faith. It's good news for those that you pray for. The Lord found you when you weren't really looking for Him. He can find those who you carry on your heart, you have a burden to see them say, oh dear God, you saved me, you saved so and so. He, she, not looking for you, but oh God, by grace, arrest them. Rejoice in the hope 
of the Gospel. Whatever else is changing around you, and culture is changing. From inside the church, I'm going to be speaking to this at a conference in a couple of weeks in Kansas on cultural Marxism, which has just taken over the culture. When you hear when you hear lunatic politicians saying some of the things they're saying, it's all to divide. It's 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 envy, the politics of envy. Pit this group against this group, divide and conquer, divide and conquer. It's coming to the church in the Trojan horse of social justice. I'll be speaking several times on this at a conference coming up. The culture is changing. We're supposed to be led by guilt. For most of all of us here, if, if you're a white heterosexual male here, you're a white supremacist. You may not know that, but that's what's being told in the culture. It's being told in the churches today. It's being told in our seminaries today. If you're a woman here, you're being held back. We want to let you be all that a woman's supposed to be. We ought to let you be preaching up here. Being taught in our seminaries. Invading our churches. And we ought to make a place in our churches. We ought to receive members who are LGBTQ adherents. Lesbian, bisexual, gay, transgender, queer. We ought to welcome them, but there, there can be gay Christians. It's being taught in our seminaries. It's being taught in our churches. It's, in, it's infiltrating us. Not us here. Not as long as I'm breathing. But it is in many places. And it's got to be combated in the Gospel. Clear in the Gospel. Loving one another in the Gospel. Make the Gospel Paramount. Sixth thing is patient in tribulation. The word there is abiding under. Abiding under the squeezing of life because it's coming, folks. I'm not going to preach my series I'm planning to preach in a couple of weeks in Kansas. But I mean, these three, this unholy trinity of ideas with the fourth one looming in the background. And that is the embracing and accepting of Islam as peace is laying siege to the battle works of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in the West, in the USA, in the Southern Baptist Convention. You better get ready. Patient in tribulation. One nominee or one one fellow running for the nomination to be president says that if he's elected president then churches will be required to accept same-sex marriage or lose their tax exempt status to be punished for it we've got to abide under sometimes the squeezing that's what the word tribulation is here jesus said in this world you will be squeezed. Philipsis. Be of good cheer, though I've overcome the world. The world can't do anything to you that God's not allowing. So get ready for it. It comes as the Lord strengthening us, testing us. It may come as an outright assault upon, upon our rights. Because if you, haven't, if you haven't figured it out by now, this culture in the West hates the Gospel. We're getting no help from our so-called friends. If you read this past week, I'll be mentioning this tonight when we study justification. The Pope himself said this week that when Jesus became a man, he ceased to be God. The head of the Catholic Church denied the deity of Jesus while on this earth. He's denied hell and other things, if I understand, he's a Marxist, if I understand what he's saying here, basically hell is only a place for people like me who preach that there is a hell, okay? But not for fun-loving people like him. Patient in tribulation. You've got to bear up. You ever thought about how 
how you disappoint others when you can't be counted on to be a, be a vital part of the body of Christ. I maintain that you should have reasonable expectations to look to me, your pastor, to, to lead out in loving one another and being faithful in the ministry here. The same thing is true of deacons. The same thing is true of Bible study teachers. The same thing is true of everyone who has covenanted together, who reads our covenant once a month together, that we have a reasonable expectation. And when you say, ah, that's for them. You're not bearing under. You're disappointing. You're setting a bad example. I want my children, they're all grown now, so they're on their own. My grandchildren to grow up believing that when you join a church, it means something. That it's not like going to the Luby's cafeteria. Yeah, I'm not much of a fan of Bible study. No, I like a little worship every now and then. I don't, I don't want to overdo it. Evening, man, I got Sunday evening busy for me. Wednesday, forget it. Maybe, Not a cafeteria. It's a family. We sat down to eat, and that's kind of what this portion is in the life of a church. And people got up and said, ah, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to eat. Well, one time you think, well, it's health conscious. Habitually, like there's something wrong with the affinity this person has for everybody else sitting at the table eating. So if you're going to be faithful, patient, bearing under, you've got to be constant in prayer. There's none of this, you won't accomplish this on your own. You don't leave it at right. I'm going to try. I'm starting over. Constant in prayer. Dear God, help me. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. God, deliver me from the distractions. When you walk out of here today, I promise you, you won't hit the parking lot and much down the street before before the enemy of your soul begins to bombard you with all the other things in life that are more important than one anothering the brothers. Constant in prayer. It's a perseverance. Devoting. Now, is it reasonable to believe that you're going to intentionally engage one another if you're not prayerfully offering the names and circumstances of one another up to the Lord. You want something that will fan the flames of your zeal? Take the membership role and just start praying through the people on membership role. Praying for them. And just go through and pray. I challenge you. And then when you, when you, when you get and say, well, gosh, I want to pray for so-and-so, but I don't know what to pray. You're getting educated, aren't you? You know that that requires knowing something about them. Constant in prayer. This is the genuineness of love. Praying for, I pray for you, by the way. I pray for you. We pray for one another on Wednesday nights at prayer meeting. We get a list together. We hear about this so-and-so's got this coming up, and we pray about that coming up, and we, so-and-so is looking for a job. We pray about employment for that person. and So-and-so is facing this job. We just, we just pray. We intercede for one another. It's wonderful. It's sweet. When I'm out and I miss that, there's a gap in my life because I've missed a fresh report from the field. Eight, contributing to the needs of the saints. Sharing with fellow believers who do not have the basic necessities of life. What, what the pastoral ministries team did recently in challenging us to consider that our brothers and sisters in Haiti who depend, as Joshua mentioned, they depend on monies for their livelihood. And Pastor Joseph has said, look, if you will give your energies and attention to me and to help, he calls us his missionaries when groups come in, to help me take care of my missionaries when they come in, he said, if you'll do that, I'll pay you a livelihood. And, and now for a year, no groups have been able to go in. And so we, we led the initiative. You've got to thank God for, for your deacon body who said, this is not right. We need to help these brothers. And so 
to help them have basic needs. We've taken up money, a little over a thousand, a couple, uh, twelve hundred dollars, to cover what they would have normally received had we gone there. We do that to one another as well. We hear about a need. We, you may not know the budget structure here, but we have a, what we call the uh, the cold water fund, which is for for family, church family. And then we have a benevolence fund, which is for people, strangers come off the street. We believe in doing good to everyone, especially those of the household of faith. We, we take care of that. That's, a, that's an evidence of love. When, when we hear about a need and we're able to meet the need, we contribute to the needs of the saints. That's what a family does. It grieves me when I hear from people and read from people who've gotten themselves so completely disconnected you talk to them, they're homeless, they're, you meet them on the street, they have nobody in their family who will help them. They have no church family who will help them. Let me tell you something, you've got to be seriously disconnected. And when somebody comes to me and tells me, well, my church won't help me, first of all, I don't believe it. Not any church I know about. And I don't want that ever to be said of us contributing to the needs of the saints give through the, through the treasury, we find out about a situation we needed ourselves. Fin finally, ninth. Seeking to show hospitality. The word hospitality here is a fascinating word. It literally means it's from the phileo word grouping. Philo or philo. Xenia. You heard of xenophobia? You know what xenophobia is? It's a fear of foreigners. A fear of strangers. This is philoxenia. It's a love for strangers. So you see how you see what happens when you want another, when, when love is sincere, when, it, when the mask is off, when we're practicing these nine things we've looked at here today and engaging that in the family of faith, do you know what happens? You cannot help but love others. The love we have for one another that flows out of a love Jesus has for us, a love we have for Him, will spill over. It becomes an evangelistic tool. Seeking. Not when it confronts you. Looking for opportunities to show a love for strangers. When you venture to bring your friends or your family into this setting, they're strangers to us. But oh, how we hope they taste and see something of the love we have for one another. It is something unique in the Christian life. And it's, not, it's in short supply in congregational life. And that's why I want us to rise above that. Yes, there's a, there's a one anothering that goes on here, but I want it to intensify. Yes, there's a brotherly love here, but I want it to intensify. I want it to so grow and become so intense and inflamed <clears throat> that, that the outward ex the evangelistic expression just is inevitable. It just spills over. Is that where you are? Is that where you want to go? Do you see the value in that? Gospel love. Loving is a family. We are a family. I want the family to grow. I want you to grow in love with Jesus. I want you to grow in love with one another. And I want you to grow in love with those who are not yet followers of Jesus Christ. What have I just described to you? The Great Commission. The Great Commandment. You're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. You're to love your neighbor as yourself. We say in our purpose statement, Bethel Baptist Church exists to follow Christ, love God, love others, serve the world. It starts with an intentional, habitual commitment to one another. Let's pray. Your Holy Father, You're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're thankful. If we come in Jesus' name, we're thankful to be a part of this family this family of faith, this, this group of people, baptized believers, 
who have a common experience of grace that outweighs, outstrips any other differences we might have. We're grateful for that miraculous power in the Gospel. And pray that You will help us to grow in love with Jesus, to be filled with the love of Jesus, that we might grow in love for one another, not just in an idea, but in a participial way, one anothering, practicing, actively engaging. And may that so fill this place that the overflow will be a love, a hospitality toward the strangers, a gospel love to see them too become part of our family of faith. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.